What's going on, everyone? Thanks for tuning in to another episode of the Ducks Dish Podcast. Uh, second episode of the Ducks Dish Podcast after we did a little bit of rebranding. Very excited to get into this episode. Another week of college football, another preview pod uh, from Ducks Dish for you guys. This time we're talking about the Colorado Buffaloes, who the Ducks will welcome to town this week for a home matchup at Austin Stadium. I'm joined today by Ducks Digest reporter Dylan Rubenking. Dylan, how we doing, man? I'm doing great. A little bit nervous for my Packers tonight, but I'm uh, I'm doing great. It's going to be a fun week of college football uh, for sure. If you're watching on the the YouTube channel, Dylan's got his Packers gear on. I had to uh, I had to convince him not to wear the cheese head on this one, but maybe that's a uh, maybe that's for a future episode. Yeah, but, maybe we'll see. We'll see. All right. Well, we'll we'll have to stay tuned for that to see what ends up happening, but. Dylan, you know, there's a lot that we can kind of dig into here with with this matchup as far as how well Oregon's been playing. Um, you know, still some areas that they want to improve, but man, Colorado's been having a rough go of it, coming off of a, a 26 to three loss to Cal um, on the road in Berkeley. Um, you know, definitely not one of the stronger teams in the Pac-12, even though the, the Ducks had you know their their uh, frustrations and, and troubles with the Bears, so. You know, what kind of sticks out to you about this matchup, uh, you know, when we're looking at it kind of broad strokes to get into it here? Yeah, I mean, I think the the clear thing that a lot of people are going to point out is how poor Colorado's offense has been this whole season. Um, you're talking about they only put up like 280 something yards of offense per game, which is at the very bottom of the FBS. Um, now, there are still some things that they do really well on offense. They run the ball fairly well. Um, have a couple of really good running backs and Jarek Broussard, who is the reigning Pac-12 Offensive Player of the Year. Um, and Alex Fontenot is a really good uh, running back as well. So, And then they have a couple of really good threats in Brandon Rice, who's the son of Jerry Rice. I know you're a 49ers fan, so I'm sure that's uh, yes, sir. That you're, that you're looking at. Do you see the flag? There it yep. is. There it is. <laughs> um, and then uh, Brady Russell is a, a really good tight end. Um, it's just it's a matter of Brendan Lewis – making the accurate read, making the accurate throw, and him being able to stay on his feet. I think, you know, with the way that that offensive line is playing, I think it could be a really, really good day for that Oregon front seven. Brendan Rice absolutely struggled against Cal. Nine for 17 for just 69 yards and a pick. He was sacked six times. I mean, you you can talk about a, a variety of areas here with, with Colorado, but I think one of the big storylines with regard to their struggles on offense has been – the offensive line and things aren't getting any easier for the buffs with them uh, firing their offensive line coach or relieving him of, of his duties, I believe was the official language. Um, so when you couple that a struggling offensive line with Oregon and how strong they looked against UCLA, that was their best pass rush outing of the, the whole year. It's looking like it could be a real long day for them on offense. Yeah. You talked about the pressure that, you know, Kayvon Thibodeau's had in the last six quarters of football. I mean, man, how do you, with the, what they have and shifting coaches and different offensive linemen up front, like how can you physically prepare for that? And it's not even just him either. Look at Brandon Dorless. He's been playing really good all year long. Talking about Popo Amave, you know, he's starting to really pick it up after a little bit of a slow start. Didn't really hear his name a little bit early on and you're starting to hear it more. Um, Keon Ware Hudson's having a great year. Christian Williams, um, I mean, it's getting better. And especially in the second half, the the Oregon pass rush has really picked it up. It seems like they make that adjustment. I think each of the last three games, you saw it against Stanford in that third quarter, saw it against Cal, especially at the end of the game. Um, and then you saw it against UCLA as well. So I just don't think Colorado with that offensive line and everything up in the air with their coaching staff, I just don't think they really have much of a chance in terms of, you know, keeping Brendan Lewis on his feet for, a very long time. He is an athletic quarterback, but I mean, when you only have a couple of seconds to get the ball out, I mean, it's, it's tough for anybody. Broussard's a, a guy that I, I really like watching play. You talk about the the great season that he had last year. He was the, the focal point of that Buffalo's uh, buffs offense um, last year. But, you know, I feel like to a degree, you know, I think that the saying goes, the running backs only as good as his offensive line. And, you know, I think that really, has, has been on display just how how he's kind of been bottled up this year by a lot of the defenses that, that they've gone against. So you're only going to get as far as your offensive line can take you, and that's true for any team. And then when you're talking about uh, Lewis, 
I feel like when I was watching that Cal game, every time they dropped back to pass, he was just running for his life. Um, so hard to get it to your playmakers uh, when when you're faced with a situation like that. You talk about uh, Brady Russell and Brendan Rice as some of the big guys to, to know there. Um, Dylan wrote a piece on Ducks Digest about some offensive and defensive players to watch for the buffs. So go on over to Ducks Digest to check that out to uh, get up to speed on, on this one. Um, but let's stay on the defensive line for a second, though, Dylan, because I think for me that was one of the big – not so much question marks for this team coming into the year, but just we didn't really know so much about what we were going to get aside from Kayvon Thibodeau because you see you have Fat Mac, Jordan Scott leaving uh, after that last season, Austin Fowley, uh no longer uh, you know with the Ducks. He's I think he's still playing for the Cowboys, so so good for him. The last that I checked, those the roster moves, they just happen so quickly in the NFL. It's a little hard to keep up sometimes. But, yeah, Pobo Amavaya has been doing great. Brendan Dorless has really blossomed. I mean, we saw him flash last year. He had that big hit on um, uh, the UCLA quarterback, Chase Griffin, uh, that forced that Jordan Happel pick six last year when they played the Bruins. And he's just kind of – he's just making his way. And I think that, you know, he's what – he's what you want to see more of from the Oregon defensive line perspective. You know, you want to see more of those big bodies coming in that are really going to just flourish You talk about him being a guy from Florida. I think that those are some of the guys that, that Oregon needs to keep getting, um, you know, to Eugene because that's going to help them win in the trenches. Big name that that's coming for the ducks this weekend to visit is Nigel E. Kelly. Since we're talking about Florida defensive linemen, but overall I've been really pleased with the the progression that we've seen from the defensive line for the Ducks so far this year. They they had some, you know, so-so performances. Um, you know, you talk about Arizona just gashing them on, on the ground and with the, the size of the bodies and the caliber of the players that they've been able to bring, that was kind of shocking. But it really looks like we're starting to see what the full potential of this defensive line is after such a strong performance against LA or against UCLA, excuse me, uh, a week ago going against Charbonnet and Britton Brown and that great O-line. Yeah. And you talked about, you know, losing Jordan Scott and losing Austin Folly. I mean, last year, their biggest weakness on defense was kind of up front, kind of getting into the backfield and stopping the run. And when you talk about replacing those guys and having a lot of inexperience behind them coming into this year, that was one thing that I think a lot of Ducks fans were worried about. It was, you know, can they stop the run and can they, you know, get a consistent pass rush. And I think we've seen that. And last week, I think, was probably their best performance, uh, like you said, stopping Zach Charbonnet, who's been absolutely mauling off uh, defenses this entire year. And Britton Brown has been really solid throughout his career, too. So, um, you know, Colorado's no slouch when it comes to the run game. I mean, you talked about Broussard um, and Fontenot. I mean, it's it, those are guys that you're going to have to stop. Those are guys that, you know, you can't really let them – you know, get a good angle. You can't let them get outside because um, they're really talented. And Bruce Hart especially is a guy that, you know, can kind of put his shoulder down and break through tackles. I mean, he's a really talented back. It's just I think Colorado needs to get him the ball more. I think that's probably one of the biggest recipes for success because when last year he was getting, you know, like 27, 28 carries a game and he was, he was going off. And I think this year I don't even know if he has more than 20 yards or 20 carries in a game. So, I think they really need to start giving him the ball because I think good things happen when uh, when he gets it. Sounds like we might be seeing Colorado turn to the run a bit more to get things going against the Ducks when they play on Saturday at Autzen Stadium uh, in Eugene. Let's see what other areas we kind of wanted to talk about here in our uh, preview podcast for the Oregon Ducks versus the Colorado Buffaloes. Uh, let's talk about um, the, the play of the secondary. I think that's been really encouraging as well. Um, you know, we're seeing, I think we're seeing the, the full potential, kind of like we said with the offensive or sorry, the defensive line. I think we're really seeing the, the defense come together for Oregon. We're seeing the picture kind of come into focus. Uh, you had a, a lot of things to overcome early on in the year with Kayvon Thibodeau getting hurt against Fresno State and then Justin Flo being out for the year, Drew Mathis being out for the year. Okay, well, no, with Justin Flo, the report was that he was out for the regular season. So reportedly out for the regular season. Let's just clarify that. We have to see what happens there. But losing key pieces early on is going to rattle any defense. So I think that maybe some fans were a little unrealistic of their expectations for just how sharp the defense would be able to look while they kind of figured out how to how to you know replace that. But 
coming off that UCLA game, we saw big plays from DJ James, Mikel Wright had some really good pass breakups in the end zone when, when uh, it looked like UCLA had kind of a second life, right? Second chance uh, to, to come back into that game and, and, you know, maybe even pull away with a win. So with them showing up, I think that's been a, a really good storyline for Oregon. And then Dante Manning had some good plays. Triquiz Bridges still getting his, uh, you know, feet underneath him, uh, tra- transitioning to corner. So I really like kind of how that group is looking right now. Uh, and especially if Roma McKinley keeps making big plays with that big pass breakup uh, against UCLA last week, it just bodes well for for the maturation of this group and just uh, you know being confident in that going forward, especially with the pass rush improving. I think that's been a huge part of their their success. Well, yeah, and the defensive line was a question mark. You, you know, I think the secondary. I- a little bit was too, because you know you had DJ James and Jamal Hill who missed the first game. Wasn't really sure how they were going to come back once they were back in practice. And then their first game was against Ohio State. I mean, that's tough for any corner in the country to go against. But they've really they've both come along really well. We talked about DJ James. You know, kind of had some struggles against some t- talented receivers um, early on in the season, but he's really locked up. I don't think they really gave up huge pass plays um, against UCLA like they did last year. So, um, and with the injury to Bennett Williams, I mean, that safety spot was, um, you know, kind of a concern with Jamal Hill. Can he kind of come back into form right from last year? Uh, And I think he's starting to do that as well. And then you're talking about Verone McKinley. Verone McKinley is, you know, a guy who's probably, I think, should be a first round consideration in the NFL draft. One of the smartest DBs out there. He's still playing lockdown. Um, overall, I think they've re- they've done a really good job of not giving up the big play. You see a lot of underneath stuff. You see a lot of short crossers, a lot of throws to the flat. They haven't really gotten burned a whole lot since maybe even that Ohio State game when I think CJ Stroud had like close to 500 yards passing. So overall, they've done a really, really good job, and especially so against UCLA and that talented group of playmakers that they've got. I like the way that their schedule kind of shakes out as it as it relates to to them getting tested as a secondary, you know, against Ohio state, not the best day from a number standpoint, but you know, no one's going to be able to slow down that, that crazy group of wideouts. So you get a, a good test early. Uh, James and Hill were, were back for that one. So they were able to get exposed to, you know, what really, really elite receiver play looks like. And then you talk about going against Stanford and their big physical wideouts uh, slash tight end hybrids. I think that is something that's going to prove, valuable as as the team moves along here and then UCLA Kyle Phillips really good Greg Dulcich he's a a good offensive weapon too so I think that's really helped and part of the concern that I kind of had was once Bennett Williams got hurt when we're focusing on the secondary here I think it was two games that they went without forcing a turnover and then I don't think it's a coincidence that once the pass rush it's get pass rush gets back to what looked like an elite level really it's not a coincidence that we saw them get multiple interceptions getting that pressure on the quarterback, just allowing the, the defensive backs to, to play more freely and ultimately make some big plays when they were needed most. Yeah, that was one concern that I really had um, after those last couple games where, you know, they led the country in turnover margin. They had those five interceptions against Arizona, and then they kind of came out and weren't able to really get off the field. I mean, they, they did have some clutch stops against Cal, um, but you did kind of see them give up some long, long drives, a lot of third and long conversions. Um, that's one thing I think still needs to be improved for, for Oregon. Um, but yeah, I think this last game, they had some timely interceptions. DJ James had the one, and I believe it was the first quarter um, to kind of slow down UCLA's momentum because they were already up big at that point. Um, and then obviously late in the game when uh, Ethan Garbers was out there. So um, I think it's been the story of the year is just the secondary making play after play, um, you know, in the fourth quarter when it really matters. And it's a lot of times thanks to that pass rush getting there and, you know, making things more difficult than it needs to be. And I think that's the recipe for success for the rest of the year when, you know, they have some really tough opponents like Utah and Oregon State still on the on the calendar. Got to give some credit to, to Marcel Yates, you know, in his first year coming over from Cal and the safeties have, have been a, a great group for, for the Ducks. Moving along this season, I think a couple areas, you know, even though we've seen some improvement in the pass rush, that was just such a glaring weakness when when Kayvon Thibodeau was hurt and then Braden Swinson was obviously working his way back. Adrian Jackson's back healthy. I think he got his most snaps of the year in that UCLA game. So that's something to, to uh, be noted. But 
even though they've made some strides, obviously they're not a perfect defense by any stretch. I think that getting off the field is going to be big for them. And and this is kind of a good opportunity against Colorado, a team that doesn't really have that, you know, potent of an offense, get off the field on third down. That's got to be really huge. And then clean up some of these penalties, you know, the Pac-12 doesn't have the the best officiating crews. I think we've definitely learned that lesson uh, the hard way, and a lot of teams have. You know what what is, what does it really do if you have you know these these people come out you know after the game's over saying oh yeah we messed up sorry about that the game's over and there's nothing you can do about it. But so what I'm saying here, point I'm trying to make is you know whether it's the right call or not, the Ducks do need to clean up the penalties. I think that's that's been something that has been a little bit of an area of concern this year, especially when you think about how, uh, you know, Mario Cristobal preaches a culture of, of discipline and, you know, just being, uh, you know, cued in on your assignments and just doing everything at a really high level. And he, he's taken ownership of that. And he says that he's, you know, trying to work on cleaning that up. So those are some of the areas for the defense that I, th- I think still need to be cleaned up. Um, but one other guy that I think we have to talk about when, before we move on to the offensive side of the ball I mean, how about Jeff Bossa, man? I mean, for a guy that moved safety, moved to linebacker from safety, he's just been having a heck of a season, and it looks like he's getting better every week. Yeah, when I was out there for the Cal game, I was really surprised to see him trot out onto the field on the first snap because he was not really out there um, on the depth chart, on the organizational chart as a starting, you know, that will linebacker, that middle linebacker. Um, I was really surprised to see that because I know they've talked highly of Keith Brown. He kind of had some injuries kind of some inconsistent play and Jeff Bossa. I mean, yeah, he's, he's played phenomenally. And every time that Mario Cristobal is asked about him, the same word pops up. He always says that he's unselfish. Um, and that's something that really sticks out when you talk about a guy who was pretty buried on the, on the organizational chart at safety coming into the year. Now he's already worked his way up. And of course with injuries and stuff like that, but um, you know, he's worked his way up to a starting linebacker and he's playing the heck out of that position. Uh, for a guy who's just kind of learning it. So, yeah, I've been very, very impressed with him. And I think the sky's the limit for him as, you know, someone who's just learning that and at the same time learning the defense in his first year. You also have to take take into account that he's a little bit undersized for a linebacker listed on the Oregon roster on uh, godox.com at 6'2", 217. So he's kind of at a little bit of a disadvantage just from the jump in that regard. But I think when people make these transitions to different positions, it, it's a, a great way to, to see what, where their football IQ is at, right? You know, even if you're playing a different position, one of the biggest things that these coaches want to see, can you get lined up in the right spot? Can you be in the right place at the right time? Know your assignments, shoot the right gaps. And I mean, that goes hand in hand with what we were saying earlier about the defensive line play improving. It's making it easier for the linebackers to find those gaps to shoot. And Boss has also made some good plays in the run game, even though he is an undersized linebacker. Uh, I think that that's a great sign to see from a guy who who is coming in uh, and maybe had a little bit more skill as a, as a cover guy. Um, you kind of think that, right, being a defensive back. But, um, yeah, he, he's been doing great, and I think that he's been one of the best storylines of the year so far for the Ducks. But before we switch to offense, Dylan, I mean, is there anything else you want to talk about as as far as you know what we're seeing from the the Oregon defense and maybe anything else about the Colorado offense before we move on? Yeah, I think just to piggyback one last thing off of Bossa is just I think like you said, him being a defensive back kind of gives them a great asset, right? You talk about a guy who can play in the middle of the defense, can stop the run, but at the same time, you know, you can rely on him, on him to make solid plays in coverage. Because um, last year, I think. You know, you kind of saw those linebackers kind of struggled in pass coverage a little bit. So I think that's a huge asset. But, you know, talking about Colorado um, and st- stopping the third down, Colorado only converts 31 percent of their third downs, which is toward the bottom of the country. And Oregon generally has a pretty good defense when it comes to the third down. But there are a lot of noticeable um, area, you know, errors that they've made on third and long. You talk about the Cal game, Stanford game, especially. So I think some of those, you know, you just have to you just have to be disciplined because you see sometimes where they have like third and 10 and then they get like a holding penalty or an offsides. And then it makes it a lot more, you know, third and manageable kind of stuff. So I just think those third downs, they have to be disciplined, not just in not getting penalized, but also, like you said, knowing your assignments, you know, where to shoot the gaps and, you know, all that kind of stuff. Cause the third down defense is going to be big, you know, coming down the stretch when you play offenses, like the way Oregon state's been playing and the way Utah has been playing and, um, you know, Washington State's been playing. So I think, you know, getting off the field just in general is going to be huge. I'm not saying, you know, 
get three and outs every single possession. That's not realistic. But, um, you know, just having timely stops earlier than they have been um, will, you know, fare better in the long run. I feel like the great defenses can can get off the field and they should be able to to get off the field when they're facing a, an offense that isn't you know nearly as imposing as UCLA was last week. But you want to get off the field because you want to get the ball back to that offense. And the Ducks offense has uh, continued to, to improve, I feel like, over these past couple weeks. Um, you know, playing against UCLA, I think that they had a pretty solid showing. Maybe not the best from a numbers standpoint uh, on the ground with the the Russian attack, only 121 yards, but five touchdowns on on the ground is is certainly not anything that you're going to complain about. I mean, when with Travis Dye, he he just continues to to thrive. We definitely have to talk about him, but we got to start an offensive breakdown with with Anthony Brown and kind of how he's been doing so far. It was it was good in my opinion to to see how he played against UCLA. Um, had his, his best statistical day um, on the season for, for the Ducks. Um, looking for his actual line here. Here we go. 29 for 39 for 296 yards. Longest pass of the day was 32 yards. I think we did see a lot more of that in the in the UCLA game. You know, those explosive plays that Oregon fans get so excited about, and I feel like they're kind of demanding, but it's with good reason because, you know, with this much talent on your offense, you, you should be held to that standard. And, I think that even though it was encouraging to see some of those big plays, they were coming on screen passes. So I don't know how much confidence that can really give me as far as Brown pushing the ball. He did push the ball down the field when he had a couple free plays on some offside calls. And I think he's continuing to get into a better rhythm with the receivers, which is an encouraging sign for where the Ducks are in the season. And going against Colorado, you you got to think that they should be Maybe they'll, they'll probably pound the ball a little bit more because Colorado is not as stout against the run as UCLA. But that's kind of what I wanted to say about Brown. You know, those, those those two picks really almost cost them the game, it feels like, with with when they were thrown. The coaching staff was taking some accountability for the play call. But I talked about that with in our last pod with, with Nick, just about, you know, play call is the play call. You've got a veteran quarterback that can't be making those kind of decisions, uh, you know, when, when the game is is so close to being put away. And, you know, ultimately that gave UCLA a second chance. Yeah. And, you know, I think it's going to be talked about the fact that he threw the interception on that play. And yeah, it wasn't a, um, you know, necessarily probably a timely play call. I do like, however, the fact that they were aggressive in trying to go for the kill, essentially. I do appreciate that because a lot of times Oregon teams over the years have kind of played not to lose instead of playing to win. And I think that's kind of a play to win scenario. And I do appreciate that. But at the same time, you know, throwing the ball in that situation and double coverage when, you know, you could easily run the ball. It seemed like the running game had kind of been picking up toward that second half. Um, I I think that, you know, probably not that down, um, probably not in that general area that throw should have been made. So, um, but yeah, I do think that Anthony Brown had his best day as a duck. I think that's pretty easy to say. He was moving the ball very fluidly at one point he completed 11 passes in a row i think he was 10 for 10 in that third quarter um he was lights out but the thing is is that all season long you've seen him make the plays in the fourth quarter whether it be with his legs or his arm it was the complete opposite against ucla he played really well from the first three quarters and then the fourth quarter through those two picks so um i think it's just a question of you know can he put it together for for four quarters and um, against a Colorado team that's really struggled. They have a pretty good defense, but overall, um, I think this is a team that Anthony Brown should, you know, again, have a pretty good performance against. But, um, you know, Colorado's not going to force very many turnovers. They're not going to, you know, get off the field uh, all the time. They've had some really bad performances on defense and some really good ones. So at the same time that you're kind of wondering what Anthony Brown are we going to are we going to get? What kind of Colorado defense are we going to get? Are they going to pressure him? Are they going to, you know, stack the box now that they know, you know, he can't actually throw the ball down the field as they saw against UCLA? Like what what would be the approach there? So, um, you know, I think Anthony Brown just needs to continue to get consistent, not just for, you know, the fourth quarter, relying on him to step up when it seems like everybody's against him. But, you know, being there from start to finish is, is a big key. That's been one of the biggest head scratchers on the year so far. It's just been, we don't know what kind of Anthony Brown is going to show up from week to week. 
I think I tweeted during the UCLA game, uh, okay, the the Ohio State version of, of Anthony Brown has shown up this week. Got it. And, you know, that that's that, it's got to be a little bit frustrating as an offense just to, to not know exactly what you're going to get. But, you know, there are a lot of moving pieces. It's it's not just all on Brown. The, the shifting offensive line is, is something. Um, and then, you know, any anytime you're maybe not having as much of, of a success on the ground as you'd hope, it's going to put a little more pressure on on you as a quarterback, but and to an extent, it goes back to what I was saying earlier. You know, you're you're a senior quarterback, you're a grad transfer. You know, this is this is what you signed up for. You know, you come to school like Oregon. There, there's going to be big expectations placed on you. So we talked, we knocked out some of the quarterback discussion. Where you want to go next, you're done. Well, I think the one thing that a lot of people have been talking about and was actually along the lines of one of the questions that I got um, was kind of the receivers. And the one thing that I think really stood out to me when looking at the stat sheet is that. Brown completed passes to 11 different receivers. Um, three different tight ends had catches. I think two or three different, two different running backs had catches, and then the rest were receivers. Um, Devin Williams obviously had his best day of the year once again after his best day against Cal before that. And then Micah Pittman had five catches, which was his most. So, you know, UCLA secondary kind of struggled coming into this. They had one of the worst passing off, uh, passing defenses in the country up to that game. Um, and I think Oregon, for the most part, executed the way they should have um, in the passing game. You talk about almost 300 yards of passing offense. That kind of seemed like that was a lot to ask for earlier in the year. Um, and Devin Williams, I think, is kind of starting to emerge as that wide receiver one. But the one thing I'm kind of wondering is, you know, where is Johnny Johnson a little bit? Like, is, is he really getting that locked up in coverage? Is it, you know... Um, he's been kind of that security blanket all season long. He did have four catches for 45. I just feel like, you know, if you remember that 2019 year, he was getting the ball thrown his way more than anybody by far. I'm just wondering why he's not getting more looks, I guess. Johnny is a, you know, he's been one of the most consistent guys uh, in this wide receiver room, but I think it's, it's good to see Devin Williams emerging just because people have been waiting for it for so long. And you have a guy that can be that uh, big mismatch. You, you just want to feed him the ball. So, I'm, I mean, I'm not so much concerned about maybe Johnny not getting as many targets just because we're seeing some of these other guys emerge. And it's been, you know, <clears throat> you know, even if he maybe wasn't wide receiver one to necessarily, I feel like it was kind of Johnny's show <clears throat> for the longest time. Excuse me. My throat's getting a little dry here. Um, but but Devin's been Devin's been great. And it definitely is, uh, you know, reassuring to see that that Brown's willing to take some of those deep shots and, and throw it up to him, get some back shoulder throws in there. Micah Pittman, I, I, I'm I'm a big Micah Pittman fan. I feel like he's he's someone I've uh, been pretty high on since he recruit since he committed, and he's had some trouble staying healthy. You know, well, since he's been at Oregon, um, I believe he broke his wrist or you know his his arm against Arizona in his freshman year when he was uh, going for that. Uh, trying to get that touchdown down near the goal line. So it's got to be frustrating for him, you know, just to, you know, he's a guy that that obviously prioritizes, you know, taking care of his body. But, you know, if, if it's not working with you, there's only so much you can do. But I really feel like he's finding strides. So that was one of our big focuses this week uh, on the site, just talking about the emergence of, of Pittman and Williams. Because he both of those guys are, are the kinds of players that can be the yards after catch guys. And that's just something that I feel like we haven't seen from Oregon for a while. You know, maybe that has part partially to do with the quarterback play. Um, you know, it hasn't been at, at a super high level both of these past seasons. You know, we're talking about 2021 and 2020. But that also has to do, uh, you know, there's there's a lot of components. You know, the, the route, the protection, the throw. Can these wide receivers get that separation? How open are they really when they're getting the ball? And then is the quarterback just giving them the ball when the DB's right there? Maybe there's a better option, which we've seen plenty of times this year when there's someone running up the sideline and Brown just hasn't seen them. So you're not trying to, to, to rag on Brown, uh, but you know, you got to kind of try to call it how it is. And, and obviously it hasn't been up to the level that it needs to be, but they're still winning games and maybe he's turning the corner here right at uh, you know the midway mark. Yeah. I think the one thing that people got so used to with Justin Herbert was you know, he was kind of more of a risk taker. He was a little bit more of a guy who, you know, can really dice you up throwing the ball and can fit it in some tight windows. Um, and Anthony Brown has not really, really shown consistently that he's that guy. Now you're talking about that throw to Jalen Red against Cal. That was that was along the lines of a Justin Herbert-like throw. 
Um, but at the same time, you know, like you said, there's so many occasions where you kind of see a guy in the backfield, you know, in the secondary getting um, kind of frustrated because you can see him like he's waving his arm and he's open and um, Anthony Brown kind of just dumps it off down low. Um, I think against a team like Colorado, where your defense is probably going to get you the ball back a number of times, I feel like you have to really, I, I think this is a game where Oregon needs to put up 40 points um, and win very comfortably and, you know, start out hot and finish hot. I think Oregon has to play, you know, a full 60 minutes on both sides of the ball um, because I think Oregon fans are really waiting for a full performance against a team that they should really wipe the floor with. Um, Cause if it's a, one of those games where, you know, everybody's dancing to shout and it's a little closer than it should be. I, I, I just feel like fans won't be sold um, on this team potentially being a playoff team. Cause this is arguably their easiest opponent of the season. The thing I like about this game for Oregon is, is when it comes in the season, I feel like that, that game against UCLA was a, a huge test for them. Um, you know, they, they've now shown up in, in two of their three road games uh, this year with, with, you know, that game against Ohio state, obviously being the, the first big test and then things were kind of shaky against Stanford. Uh, but it looks like they could, I mean, it looks like they've learned from that uh, to a degree, especially when you see how the UCLA game shook out. So I, I kind of view this game as, I mean, I don't want to say a tune up game because every game, every regular season game, you know, is a playoff game. That's what we've heard from this program week in and week out that they're not taking anybody lightly. And, and that hasn't changed, you know, going to the pressers this week, that's still very much the, the, the mantra there. The whole one no mentality is, is still definitely in effect, but it goes back to what you were saying about them kind of maybe not being the best team. And it looks like a pretty favorable matchup across all, all areas for, for the ducks. So can, I'm going to be looking in this game. Can they come in and dominate? Can they play that full four quarters and I almost wonder, I mean, you want to see them play a full four quarters, but can they start fast too? Because that hasn't been something that they've been particularly good at this year, um, just from an overall team perspective. But we were talking about the wideouts, uh, Dylan. I kind of want to see a little bit more from the tight ends. It was a pretty quiet day from the tight ends against UCLA. Maybe that's just how the game plan shook out. But uh, we saw a lot of Spencer Webb. He was very involved against UCLA. Uh, and then Terrence Ferguson, Malik Montevao. Um, we're obviously out there as well, but when you have a little bit of a softer matchup here and you want to see more from the passing game, I mean, credit to, they're all really strong blockers. I think that, you know, Ferguson and Montevao are, are some of the, the best blockers and we're seeing more of DJ Johnson as well. We wrote earlier this week about his role, maybe be shift might be shifting with the defense getting healthier. So there's a lot of talent at the at tight end room as well. And, um, you know, maybe they're worth a mention here. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, each one, um, Manaval, Ferguson, and Spencer Webb, they only had one catch for a single digit yardage. Um, they both played, they all played really well um, in terms of blocking, like you said. So um, we kind of knew going into the year that it was just going to be a loaded room of playmakers. And you kind of knew that somebody was going to get left out a little bit. I didn't really think it was going to be like all three of those tight ends because um, neither of them have really had a huge amount of you know, catches, uh, we're even talking about like four or five catches in a game. So, um, you know, each one has looked promising at times. Matt Aval looked great against Ohio State. Ferguson, I believe, had a touchdown or two um, against Arizona and Stony Brook in that area. And then Spencer Webb, you know, has had his moments um, as well, um, especially the 2019 season. He was, you know, a really great, um, reliable option. So, um, yeah, I'm with you. I think they need to find some uh, some ways for them to succeed more than just blocking and kind of protecting Anthony Brown. I think they really need to kind of have a big day. Um, but of course, you know, Devin Williams, Micah Pittman, it seems like a lot of people that are, you know, in that wide receiver and tight end room is they're all kind of in this development phase where it's like, you don't really a hundred percent know what you're going to get. I think in terms of development, I think the only guys where you kind of know is Jalen Red and Johnny Johnson, just because they've been there for so long. Um, so there's a lot of guys that you're kind of trying to bring along at the same time and, you know, get targets. So everybody's happy, but, um, yeah, I do think that when those tight ends get involved, um, when, when they get their hands on the ball, really good things happen. And I will say, especially with Terrence Ferguson, I think he's probably the most athletic of the bunch. I think he's got the softest hands, um, and he's very, very athletic and can run after the catch too. He was a guy that I was super high on from the minute that he committed, and it's, it's pretty cool to, to see him getting some significant time here as a freshman. Uh, 
with with Oregon, we've obviously talked a lot about the pass game, but we know that Oregon loves to run the ball. Things looking like they might shake out a little bit differently from a personnel perspective this week against the Buffs. Uh, Alex Forsyth is day to day right now. Mario Cristobal telling us, uh, you know, still working on dealing with uh, those back spasms that have uh, kept him out the past couple weeks. Looked like he was going to be good to go against UCLA. Went through warmups in full gear, and then uh, eventually went to the locker room and came back out in street clothes, still wearing uh, you know that that back brace. So. We'll have to see if he plays, you know, Cristobal sounds less than confident. I would say that he's going to be available, but uh, the Ducks have a really, really capable backup. If you want to call him a backup center at this point, uh, Ryan Walk, he's just been super versatile. And then we've seen some other guys step up with Jackson Powers Johnson spraining his ankle and leaving early in that game against the Bruins. Dawson Jaramillo has come in and looked really good. Steven Jones is getting a lot more involved. TJ Bass got uh, moved out to tackle a little bit. So I think that's kind of something that I'm going to be interested to see. But at the same time, all those rotations that we saw throughout the, the you know, first half of the season, I think we're seeing some of the return on that with, with how seamlessly these guys have been shifting. And, and for the most part, Anthony Brown's been kept up right and they've been able to keep moving the ball. Not a huge day on the ground, like I said, statistically, but when they needed to run the ball, they got it done. Yeah. And Joe Moore had talked about it, um, be- you know, before that UCLA game, like we know we're going to have to throw the ball down the field um, because they're a really UCLA was a really stout run defense. But at the same time, you don't want to completely abandon it because that's what you do best. And I think against this Colorado defense, um, that's one thing that they're really going to have to pound home. But, you know, when, one thing with Forsyth, the thing that was really weird with the language with Cristobal was it seemed like every week now, of course, back spasms are really, you, you know, it can happen whenever um, the last couple of weeks, he said, you know, he's good to go. He'll be ready to go. And then this one, the way that he worded it was, I wouldn't count on it, which kind of sparked a red flag for me a little bit. Like, I feel like at this point, it's safe to say that the ducks probably won't have him in Colorado. Um, and of course they'd like to have him out there, but like you said, Ryan walk has been absolutely killing it at that center spot. Um, and he's done phenomenally wherever you put him, whether it's at either guard or at center. Um, and then TJ Bass, I thought, played a really good game at left tackle after playing pretty much at the guard spot, I think, throughout his Oregon career. I don't think I'd ever seen him at tackle before, um, and he did a really good job. UCLA has a really stout front. Um, Colorado has some guys up front, too, um, that can really, you know, that front seven brings a lot of pressure, and they're really talented and really productive, um, especially those linebackers. They have some really good linebackers, but not having Nate Landman is going to be um, a big, big loss for Colorado, probably one of the best linebackers um, in the Pac-12, especially one of the most experienced. So, um, yeah, that offensive line is going to be a big thing to watch to see if they kind of keep the rotations the way they have been. Um, I expect them to, but, you know, whoever gets in there, I feel like is producing at this point. Going to gonna be someone to monitor with, with how the, the Buffs deal with, with Landman's uh, absence uh, against Oregon. Um seeing that he's he's likely out is kind of what, what we were hearing from Carl Durrell um, earlier this week. So still got to see if he ends up suiting up, but it's looking like he's not going to be available for this one. But, man, I think one of the other big storylines with this team, with this offense, has, has been Travis Dye as, as running back one. We, we knew he was going to be the focus of it, but now we have two weeks of, you know, having a little bit of a bigger sample size with him. And man, he he has just been utterly dominant. Whatever they're asking for him, to, uh, asking of him, asking him to do, he, he's been, you know, living up to the hype and, and then some. But I feel like we haven't really seen much of the rotation at all. I feel like Carwell's gotten a couple carries here and there these past couple weeks as the the number two, if you want to call him that, because we also saw Seven McGee. He made some pretty good plays against UCLA. But I think maybe part of that is because Anthony Brown's been running the ball still, so maybe some of those carries that would come to a number two back on like an RPO kind of play, maybe Brown's taking them, but that's kind of something that I feel like has still been a little unanswered for me since Verdell went down with that injury was we still don't really know much about what's going on with that, that number two back and kind of what, what the rotation really looks like. And maybe we won't. Yeah. It's definitely a, gr- a question that we've had actually really since, even before the season, you kind of knew you were going to have that CJ Verdell, Travis die, you know, dynamic duo. And there was a lot of guys that were itching to get out there and now it's kind of their time to go. But uh, 
you know, going back to Travis Dye, I feel like the one thing that you can really say about him throughout his career is that he just understands his assignment. And he always has, no matter what he's asked to do, he does it. And, you know, when early in the game, when the, that rushing offense wasn't really getting a whole lot of yardage, they were asking him, you know, you got to be more of like what we had with Cyrus Abibi Likio. It just, you know, we need you to kind of be this, you know, uh, short yardage guy, the goal line, the goal line guy, and he was that four straight carries with with touchdowns. I mean, in those at those points in those drives before that, he wasn't even really getting any carries because I mean, how can you have four straight carries with a touchdown? Um, that's just unheard of, literally. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think Seven McGee, um, you know, looked really really good. Had an 11 yard run um, at a pretty important time. Byron Cardwell had some important runs um, in that Cal game, so. Um, I think I'd rather see, you know, die. I like seeing him get the load, but at the same time, like you want to know what these other guys have because anything can happen. Nobody expected CJ Riddell to be out. Um, and, you know, you have so much talent back there. It's I think it's time to to let him loose a little bit. Maybe not, you know, get 10 carries for each one or anything like that. Not a running back by committee or, or anything like that, but, you know, getting him involved in some short yardage plays, some goal line plays too. I, I agree with, with that. Definitely want to see more involvement from their part. Uh, as we wind down here on this uh, Colorado preview pod episode of the Ducks Dish podcast, we uh, we have some mailbag questions to get to. Uh, Dylan and I will usually you know put out calls for, for questions before we record. Um, want to get a little bit better about giving you guys time to do that. So that's, that's on me. Um, but we did get some questions on uh, Twitter and Facebook. So we're going to start with, uh, with this one here from almost always FB blog slash Otani for MVP at Josh underscore Ray underscore A. His question is, why haven't the Ducks been able to recruit slash develop top receiving talent? Good to great teams have been held back in the past few years by a lack of outside playmakers. Do you want to take this one or should I start? Um, I, I talked about it a little bit. Um, I, I do think that in terms of recruiting, I think that's almost certainly picked up the last couple of years. Um, especially going back to like 2020 had Chris Hudson and now this year they had an absolutely loaded class. So I don't think recruiting is necessarily a problem now. Um, development, it's kind of tough. Like we talked about, there's so many guys that are, that are out there trying to get the ball in their hands and trying to get more playing time. It's just, you know, it, it's it's kind of a good problem to have when you have so many guys who are so talented that, you know, who do you get the ball to? So, you know, the Ducks, you don't really think of them as kind of an NFL receiver factory. Um, but at the same time, they have a lot of guys that can produce um, when they're in an Oregon uniform. Um, and I think this year, I think you're going to start to see some guys kind of break out. I think Devin Williams is starting to see it now. Micah Pittman, you're seeing it week by week. Um, I think Troy Franklin has been getting the most out of the true freshman. Um, Dante Thornton, I would love to see more of him, but um, we'll have to see with him. But I don't, I don't know if it's you know necessarily a knack that they're not developing them. I think it's kind of you know just a problem that they have with you know just so many guys in the room, uh, which is what a lot of teams around the country, a lot of elite teams have. Um, they have a lot of really good, talented guys. Look at Ohio State, probably not the best example, but. Um, you know, they have a lot of guys, a lot of five-star guys who are, who are on the bench. So, um, I guess it's a good problem to have, but at the same time, you'd probably like to see more production, but like we talked about, it goes to play calling and, you know, game planning and Anthony Brown's play and all that kind of stuff too. So kind of ran around the answer there, but, um, yeah, it's a lot of different things there. Yeah. Staying along those lines, I, I'd say that that wide receiver is, is the position, if not the that we've seen improve the most, definitely one of the ones that has been you know the most heavily invested in since Mario Cristobal took over. You talk about Brian McClendon coming in last year, bringing in three high school All Americans in his first uh, receiving, sorry, recruiting cycle, and then we already know that he has a lot of big names in, in the 2022 cycle with Tetairo and McMillan, Isaiah Satania, Stephon Johnson Jr., Nick Anderson. I mean, there's just so much talent there. And I think sometimes people, if they don't see him early, then they kind of get a little bit skeptical. But it is a lot of things that are at play here. I think part of it, you look at the past two seasons, I think they've been kind of limited by the quarterback play. I mean, it, you, I think you you have to certainly consider that when you're looking at a, a question like this. But a lot of it, I think, also has to do with just their identity. You know, Mario Cristobal has 
prided himself on winning the battle in the trenches. And that kind of goes hand in hand with running the ball so much. And I mean, Oregon's always been a, a run first team. And I don't think that's changing anytime soon, but also if you look at how some of these games have shaken out, they're still winning. So why, why do you, I mean, I think it was, it was nice. That was one of the things I liked the most about last game, even though they had all their touchdowns on the ground, I feel like they were turning to the past more than they had at any point this year, really. So um, I, I mean, you could talk about the development aspect just from, you know, an NFL standpoint, they're not putting a lot of receivers in the league. I mean, Jawan Johnson's got moved to tight end now with, with the saints. So it's encouraging to see him do really well, but I, I think it's certainly a good point. You know, we haven't seen someone that Oregon has recruited as a, a high school recruit brought in the program and then, you know, develop him to be a top end guy. I mean, maybe you look at Dylan Mitchell, he was the most productive receiver that, that we've seen recently. And I don't think he's doing anything in the NFL unless I'm mistaken. Uh, I know he was on the Vikings for a little bit, but I think that it's, uh, you know, it's, it's not, e- it's not as easy as just getting one, two good classes. you got to get elite classes year after year. The quarterback play has to improve. And even though there, like you were saying, there have been so many capable wideouts. I would personally like to see a little bit more consistency as far as, you know, these are the kind of standard guys that we're getting here. So, you know, Jalen Red and Johnny Johnson, they're in their last years. So I think if they can have strong years, I feel a little bit more confident about Johnson from an NFL standpoint. And I think a lot of people would probably say that just because he has a, a bigger frame, but man, J- Jalen Red's a competitor, man. He, he just puts it all out there every time he's on the field, tremendous heart, really, really good blocker. And, um, I think he, he has some some big plays in store for him the rest of the way this season. Yeah, I think Jalen Red is probably the more explosive of the bunch throughout his career. Um, I feel like Johnny Johnson is probably a more reliable um, kind of like third down guy, uh, short yardage guy, a guy that, you know, is a very reliable and very talented route runner. Um, so, yeah, I definitely agree that in terms of the NFL, he's he's up there. But I feel like with who they're recruiting the last couple of years, you talked about the 2022 guys all the 21 guys that are on the roster. I feel like, you know, once the team gets, um, you know, some of the older guys move on, I feel like you're going to see some of that, uh, some of that change a little bit. I think they could start pumping out some NFL receivers because I think there might be some on this roster. Definitely. There, there's definitely some huge talent here. And Brian McClendon has proven that he's one of the best in the business. So I have to just say, you know, be patient. I, I think that even though it seems like it's been kind of limited, uh, or just, you know, not the best recently. Um, I think that this game against UCLA was just just a small sample size of, of what this wide receiver core is really capable of. Just get these guys the ball in the right situations with, with some space. You talk about Micah Pittman. He's had some really big explosive plays, had that huge catch and run against Stanford um, that comes to mind, and he's doing really well in the receiving game as well. So that that's a room that, that is loaded with, with talent. And we're starting to see some of that production, right? You know, McClendon talked about earlier this year, he's saying, you know, I, I appreciate all the praise with the talent, but I want to see that produce. I want to see them take all that hype and, you know, just shove it to the side and just, because it's a whole other whole other deal when you get to college, you know, high school doesn't matter at all. It's going to be, can you show up every day, work your tail off? Can you put in the extra work? Can you separate yourself from the other guys in, in a crowded room? And then um, you, know, you got to get open and you got to block. And there's just so many different parts. So um, I have all the confidence in the world in this and this Oregon wide receiver group. Uh, and I think there's some really big things in store there. Uh, we did get a couple more questions um, that we want to get to. So let's uh, let's move on to that. This is coming from Richard Porter on Facebook. Thanks for your question, Richard. He uh, had two questions, actually. Starting off, he said, is Brian Addison going to get playing time that Bennett – now that Bennett and Happel are both injured. Um, I think he's definitely in line to get, get some more playing time. We, we saw him a little bit more involved on a couple uh, various packages against UCLA. Um, and I kind of thought it was funny that he was getting more involved against UCLA, considering that he was committed there a while ago, just a, a really small detail, but that kind of came to mind, but he's a, yeah, he's a really, really big dude. Um, you know, very athletic for his size and it, it's, I think he could see you could see him get involved more. Damon David um, figures to to be a guy that should be getting a little bit more involved. Um, he kind of missed some important time just with his injury. Um, I believe it was around fall camp that that he uh, was a little bit banged up. Um, 
but I think I have to double check on that one. But he he's he's easing back in now, so I think he he's um pretty much a full go. So um he's a guy that we could be seeing more of as that that safety rotation kind of maybe looks a little bit different with with Happel out now and then Bennett Williams out for the year. Yeah, I definitely think this could be the game where we see Brian Addison a little bit more. Um, you know, making that transition from wide receiver to to safety is is kind of a wild one for someone who's I believe six five. Um, but I, it sounds like you know he's picked it up really well. I remember they were being asked about him pretty often in fall camp, and uh, they said he was picking it up really well and he's got really good coverage skills. So um, I'm really excited to to see that you know that work in progress from the past off season to see you know just how good he can be because I mean six five at safety that's that's <laughs> that's crazy. So. I would really like to see it. And um, honestly, I would have liked to have seen it against Stanford with all those, those, you know, mighty receivers and tight ends that they've got back there. Um, but I think his time is, is coming really soon, especially, you know, like you said this week with Happel and, and Williams both out, I feel like we could see him probably a bit in the second half, especially if it's a blowout, like most people are expecting it to. All right. Last question for us here on the mailbag portion of the podcast. Also from Richard. Are we going to bring in another offensive lineman in the 2021 class now that another scholarship is freed up from transfer? Um, I'm assuming he means 2022 class, uh, maybe just a typo there. Um, but, you know, for, for those that don't know, Kingsley Suamataya uh, announcing that he – well, he actually hasn't announced it. I shouldn't say that. But, um, you know, it, it was uh, announced by, uh, you know, various outlets, and then Mario Cristobal confirmed it in the press conferences when he was asked about uh, Kingsley's transfer – and he's going to be, uh, it looks like he is going to be moving on. So with his, uh, you know, transfer, we have to see how that shakes out still. Um, you know, we don't know uh, if he is going to be transferring somewhere else, but the Ducks do have a lot of offensive linemen in this class, right? I wrote, I wrote a story about this earlier today on Ducks Digest about kind of the impact of his transfer. I wouldn't be surprised if they took another offensive lineman just with how they've been prioritizing it. Um, in the trenches, but I think they probably need more help all on the D line. Uh, that's kind of where I think they, they've been missing that that big name uh, impact kind of a guy. Um, so you talk about guys like Joshua Connerly. I think he's been on their their wish list for for some time from uh, the Seattle area, Rainier Beach. He's a guy that I think is is definitely worth taking. You're not going to turn him away um, anytime you can take someone out of the Huskies' backyard. So I wouldn't say that it's a pressing need right now, but certainly something that uh, I wouldn't be surprised to see them do. Yeah. And I mean, you talked about the guys with 2022. I mean, they've got a lot of talent on offensive line coming in Kelvin banks, especially, um, you know, they got Dave Uly from Washington. Um, you know, um, uh, let's see Percy Lewis, if he sticks around, um, which everybody expects, I believe Cameron Williams. I mean, there's just so many guys. I feel like it could be a problem. You might see another guy, maybe, um, I don't know about decommitting, but maybe another guy entered the transfer portal. Me, honestly, I didn't expect it to be Kingsley um, to be entering the transfer portal. Um, but I kind of, you know, with as many guys that they brought in in 2022, I was a little afraid of that, that somebody would, you know, pro- potentially lose their spot that they might have been promised when they were recruited. Um, and Michael Wooten's another guy as well that's going to be coming to Eugene uh, next year so. Yeah, there's there's going to be a lot, and then like Bram Walden and um, you know Jonah Miller, those are a couple guys who were recruited in 2021 that haven't gotten playing time yet. So uh, yeah, it's kind of a it's kind of an issue, a good issue to have um, because of just so much talent. Um, but I, I think honestly, Kingsley might have started next year um, if he would have stuck around. Um, yeah, I don't know. I don't think that they would probably bring in any more than one for the rest of the 2022 class. Cause now you got 23 kind of starting up and you know, it's going to be a pretty young offensive line I would imagine next year. Um, so yeah, it's, it's really interesting, but I feel like if they're going to add anybody, the guy that's probably most realistic is, is Josh Connerly, but I know Michigan and Washington were kind of in that mix too. I believe Michigan, um, but he'd probably be the biggest target for sure. But um, yeah, it's kind of up in the air. The Ducks could bring back a, a lot of their starting offensive line next year. I believe George Moore is the only one who doesn't have any more eligibility after this season. Uh, but, you know, Juco guys like TJ Bass and and Molly Sala, uh, Amavai Laulu, they've been playing uh, pretty pretty solid this year. So 
you know, you never know. We got to see what happens uh, by the time the season wraps up. So not a pressing need. I think it's kind of what me and Dylan can both agree on. Um, but it's it's certainly been, uh, you know, kind of in, in the culture and identity for this team to prioritize offensive linemen. Um, well, I think that that's everything that we had for, for this episode, Dylan, of the, the Ducks Dish podcast. Before we hop on out of here, I uh, always want to give people a chance to plug their work. Where can people find more of you? Yeah, so I'm pumping stuff out for Ducks Digest pretty much every day. Uh, you can find me over there. Um, follow me on Twitter at DRK Sports News. I'm usually tweeting over there pretty often. And then you can also find me on the Transfer Portal CFB. We're approaching 1,500 followers. So go ahead and join that wagon while we're growing. Awesome stuff. And then uh, we'll have this episode of the podcast on my YouTube channel as well. Oregon football, Max Torres is the name of the channel. So go ahead and subscribe to the channel over there. Only takes two seconds out of your day. And and it really goes a long way helping us uh, do our thing covering the ducks. So just a friendly reminder there, and then go ahead and uh, find us at uh, ducksdigest.com covering the ducks for uh, sports illustrated on fan nation. It's been a blast. And then you can find us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, all at Ducks Digest. Got a bunch of great stuff coming out all the time. So we'll go ahead and hop on out of here. Make sure to tune in for our next episode, breaking down the Colorado game. And then we'll also have live coverage of Oregon versus Colorado come Saturday. So make sure you tune in there. But thanks, everybody, for listening. It was another great episode, and we'll see you in the next one.